Hey, welcome back into Thanksgiving week, Middle Game Live. Bash and I are here. I feel like I'm running in quicksand and uh, feel like I'm already had a, I've already had one session of physical therapy in this morning. Just crammed a power shake, protein shake, and I uh, feel like I've got 10,000 uh, elephants running in my stomach right now. So how are you doing, Bash? Slightly better, I would say. Better, yeah. uh, my hip's good. Uh, no PT this morning, um, but I did have a Chick-fil-A biscuit. So, oh, Damn you. Yeah. So there's a place right next to the physical therapy. It's this nutrition place, and I've watched people coming out of it, and I've, I've always been like, I'm going to try it. So I went in there this morning to get a coffee because I am literally running. I don't know. I think it's the medication I take at night that just crushes me in the morning. Like I cannot. Like literally right now, if you said go back to bed, I'd be asleep till noon. I mean, I cannot. Like I was on the table near the end and they were working on my calf and I fell asleep. Yeah, after an hour nice. of physical therapy. Yeah. Um, so I went over there to get a coffee and he has this protein coffee. So I ordered that. And then he's like, I got these meal replacement shakes. And I'm like, well, I haven't had breakfast yet. 250 mm -hmm. calories, 40 grams of protein. I'm like, all right, let's do it. You know, drank it. It was stupid good. It tasted like a dessert. Um, and then I was like, well, I don't really feel a difference. So I started drinking a little bit of the coffee and then all of a sudden it was like, holy cow. I just, just exploded eight. inside of your stomach. Dude, I felt like I just hit a Chinese buffet and ate for four hours on a road trip. You remember those days <laughs> in baseball when you'd go in there and you eat it between a double header? Yeah. That's what I yeah. felt like. I was like sitting, I'm like, oh my God, I don't know if I can do middle game live. Like I am so full right now. I don't feel sick. I'm just so full. So we'll see. We'll see how long this meal replacement lasts. Yeah, we're gonna have to. You're gonna have to find a way. Cause... Yeah, I'm gonna have to gut through it. But I feel like my eyes are all like, oh my God, I'm gonna. Did you go to one of those nutrition places that has the like expensive Kool Aid? No. Oh, okay. No, 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 no. But I was looking for something that was like a double, triple espresso shot, you know. But then I'd be shaking, and my anxiety would be through the roof. You know, through the roof. Through the roof. Speaking of anxiety, kick anxiety's ass. If you've read it, if you liked it, please, 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 please give me a, a review on Amazon. If you didn't like it, I'd be okay with that review too. Okay. Um, I just want some reviews. If you if you were looking for a book, um, and if you're looking for something to help someone in your life who's struggling with anxiety, listen, the book has a slant towards athletics. There's no doubt about it, because that's my market. However, People ask me all the time, is this reputable? Is this appropriate for people who are not in sports? Thousand percent. Okay. The skills, the, the tools, everything will help you. Okay. Um, the, the most feedback I've gotten so far from people is, my God, it feels like it's talking directly to me. Um, and then that realization hits. But the thing that is hitting people that I want people to understand is that people are saying, but I have to suffer with this for life, right? Like, I think there's this hope and dream that anxiety is going to go away. And a I harsh think realization. That's a harsh realization. Uh, I had a guy sent me a message. It was like, I can't believe that the message of this is I got to learn to deal with it. I thought there was a way it's going to go away. And uh, I, it, it was, uh, it was like, you know, it goes, away, it goes down. It goes down doesn't always go away. So, I mean, I feel like you can be in control of it. You can control how it impacts you. Yeah. And as a result, yeah, you can control of like your yeah, your side of it. Well, think about it like this, right? I'm an only child, so I've never had to deal with this. But, you know, if you're if you are in a life where you have a, a sibling, a friend, a cousin, somebody who just always knows how to get under your skin, they know that exact way to do it. And then all of a sudden, they know that it's bothering you. They just keep doing it. Once they know that it's not bothering you anymore, it loses its power. Um, and when it loses its power, they stop doing it. Well, that's what anxiety does. Once it realizes it can't control every element of who you are, because that's the underlying purpose of anxiety is to alert you to stress, risk, worry, insecurities, everything. It's a threat detection system. Okay. And 
sometimes the lack of anxiety is scary for people. But the reality is, is that once it has no power over you, that you can progress, succeed, have control of life, all those things. Mm -hmm. you have that, you know, it's a pretty powerful place to be because nothing can bring you down. So if you've read it, you like it, it's doing extraordinarily well. The book has far exceeded my expectations. We did not do, as I said, we did not do a massive launch plan that was against everybody's advice. But I just like to like, wing it, man. I just wanted to wing it. I wanted to get the thing out. I, I felt like I believe in the book so much that I, I didn't want this like grand scam. I want people to read the book, not just to have the book because um, I believe in it. So, you know, we will, uh, if, if you've read it, drop a comment. If you, you know, this is a great week to get through it. Listen, in the true Brett McCabe way, this is not a, this is not a toilet book. This is not a book you can read on one toilet sitting. Okay. Um, you've got, it's, it's work. So, um, you know, other than that, Hey, Ole Miss, how'd they do this weekend? They won, didn't they? Yeah, they kind of slept walk through. Uh, what's the original name of uh, Louisiana Monroe? Uh, Northeast Louisiana. Northeast, so yeah, played Northeast Louisiana. Yeah, that's still their name, by the kind way. Kind of dominated the state of Louisiana this year. Yeah, you have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, LSU. But I mean, was no you, contest. Um, Tulane. Tulane's a good team. Northeast Louisiana. Yeah. So and Jaden Daniels will win the Heisman, hopefully. Yeah, he's stupid good. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. He is stupid good. Mm -hmm. Yes, Egg Bowl week, says Chris. It is, and it's always a nervous time because you I mean, is this is Egg Bowl honest. is Egg Bowl always a game where one coach has been fired in it? Traditionally, if no one's ever this is the first time I can remember where no one's been or that a coach has been fired uh, technically. Okay. Ed O got fired after uh, Sylvester Croom worked him over pretty good. Okay. Um, but I thought that was the tradition. There's always a coach getting fired after this, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah. Zach uh, Zach Arnett, the former coach at Mississippi yes. State, was in a um, just an impossible situation. Impossible. So it was, so. Whatever. And it's I got somebody on Instagram asking where you can buy the book. You can go to Amazon right now. It's sitting up. It's number one release in sports psychology and a couple other categories. So please, you can get it on Kindle. The number one question we get is when are these book? When are my books going to be on Audible? Um. My goal is to get them on Audible at some point. The The rate limiting factor is I have to go sit in the studio and read my books. Okay. Um, I don't want somebody else to read them. And if you know Brett, he doesn't read any of this stuff. So that's <laughs> going to be the most difficult part is to get him to actually go back review and read. his own material. Yes. I get to a point where I can't look at it anymore. And, and then I'll pick it up and read it and go, man, this is actually pretty good. And there yeah, was actually who wrote this. You know, oh, so I read one of somebody in, on our social media, Logan's team, put up a clip, like a book copy. At so, one point. Shout out social media team. Yes, yeah, social media team, talking social, and uh, and I I started reading it, and I was like, man, this is actually really good. This is like really good. And then I realized it was my book. Um, nice. Yeah, so that made me feel good. So good. if you've got a question, leave them in our comments. Um, love to answer as many as I've got a couple teed up and ready to go. Um, and we're going to answer as many as we can today. We know it's Thanksgiving week here in the United States. Uh, Tom had a, asked a really good question though, from North of the border. What is the egg bowl? Jeez, Tom, it is, uh, okay. It's college football. It is the Ole Miss Rebels versus the Mississippi State Bulldogs. I don't know where the egg came from. I don't know the significance of it. I uh, just probably it's, it's a trophy with the giant golden egg at the top of it, and it is uh, it is the most toxic rivalry in college. You think sports. worse than Auburn? Worse than Auburn, Alabama, Michigan State, Ohio State, Michigan, Ohio State. 
Yeah, from a toxic standpoint. I'm not saying as far as like competitive nature. No, it's not at all from a competitive nature. What's the toxic? It is, oh, just just absolute hate and literally like. I feel like for the majority of people, it's like their year. Gotcha. You no, know, it's like their mood is genuinely affected by this football game. And uh, the football on top looks more like an egg than a football. Yes, 100%. Chris, Chris, are you – side side note, Chris, are you an Ole Miss or Mississippi State fan? Um, but, it's yeah, it's just toxic. It's, it's just one of those things that uh, William said. We had a Bama fan kill a tree. Yeah. That That's true. also accurate. Um, so, yeah, we hadn't gotten anything quite like that. But just experiencing it firsthand, I was like – this is, I mean, these people are absurd. Oh, it's absurd. Like, why are we hating each other off? Of, yeah. I mean, two mediocre football programs. I mean, no offense. I mean, uh, they've had moments of glory. Um, wow. Mississippi State fan, Ole Miss grad. That's Chris, amazing. what in the world is wrong with you, dude? <laughs> Just kidding, dude. Just kidding. Um, Kevin, Michigan and Ohio State. Yeah, I don't know much about Michigan and Ohio State, like on boots on the ground level. Obviously, it's a super fun game to watch every year because both teams are always in contention and Harbaugh is just throwing freaking kerosene on the fire right now. Yes. yes. Um, Speaking of that, like Logan said, the tree poisoning killed the Auburn fan base for years. I mean, that was – so yeah. at Auburn they had these two trees at the corner that they would roll after victories. Like they didn't get to do it this weekend because they got beat by a, uh, a rent-a-win team 31-10. Uh, to 10. Um, rent but, win. <laughs> yeah, but um, paid one point eight nice. million to get beat. Um, the, that is the Hugh Freeze experience for you. I get ready. I cannot wait for them <laughs> to get that all the time. So, so what happened was a non-Alabama graduate, but an Alabama fan, which is the standard for the people who like at LSU and other places. The people who are never don't know where the library is with the most obnoxious fans sometimes. Mm-hmm. This guy goes down there and poisons the tree and calls into a national radio show, the Paul Feinbaum show, and admits that he has done this, which is a federal crime. Okay. The guy got prosecuted, everything. He's since passed away, but he killed the trees with the poison. And now they've had to replant. I mean, really stupid. I mean, just really absurd and idiotic. I mean, it's one thing to put like soap in another school's fountain. Okay, or stuff like that, but to kill the stupid trees. Um, so this is a fun week. This is a great, great week. I'll be at the Iron Bowl. I'll be uh, wearing crimson. Um, and uh, Iron Bowl is Alabama Auburn. Uh, being an LSU grad, LSU never has a natural rival at the end of the year. They tried to force Arkansas. Nobody cared. Uh, they've rolled back to uh, AM, which is a pretty heated rivalry because of all the petroleum engineers between the two schools at Houston. Um, and uh, But we, our rivalries seem to hit during the course of the year. Um, but the Magnolia Bowl. So Ole Miss wants to be a rival with LSU, but it's just kind of so like hard. Yeah, they they want to get, so LSU hard. doesn't care until they get beat. That's the problem. And and they it's like, ah, damn. I uh, know. So tremendous comments. Uh, I know on rivalry yeah. football week coming in. Don't forget it's Kentucky. Louisville. With them. Are we talking basketball? See, that's not a that's the thing, Tyler. Kentucky Louisville football. I don't know many people who get fired up, and one of my dear friends is a Kentucky grad, um, and he's like, I I hate that school, but it, it's more related to basketball. It's like Duke, North Carolina. Yeah. Um. So got a lot going on this weekend. A lot of really good football coming down the stretch. You know, we've got to settle the Heisman. We've got um, some really good matchups. And it may be some chaos in the college football playoff. It is not a clear path. Um, Alabama sitting in eighth, which is bizarre to me. Um, playing some of the best football of anybody in the country right now. But got to take care of your business. Um, and that's what we're – you know, that's the goal. So, um Anyway, it, this is great. I love it. Um, and uh, it's a great time of year. So if you want to pick up a copy of Kick Anxiety's Ass, you want to pick up a copy of Break Free from Suckville or Mindside Manifesto, um, you can do that at Amazon.com. Please, please, please. If you haven't signed up for my newsletter, go to my website, brettmccabe.com. Follow me on social media. All the different things. Um, 
and uh, we'll go from there. A couple of things that I saw during the course of the week, okay, that I think we could talk about here at the beginning. Then we're going to get some questions. Uh, Ludwig Aberg uh, wins the RSM Classic. He was playing at Texas Tech early in the season. Uh, uh, graduate of PGA Tour University, which is a advancement program, so the top players meet a certain criteria. They can advance straight to the PGA Tour. No doubt this young man has the game. He was a Ryder Cupper. Um, and the the beauty of him is that he's now ranked 32nd in the world and playing amazing golf. Um, really cool to see. The beauty of great players is great players will perform. Um, and somebody asked me, do you think the Ryder Cup helped him? He's already won on the DP World Tour, the European Tour. And when players play at such a pressure place, right, such a pressure-filled environment, um, you know, what happens is they learn. And it's not that they don't experience pressure at the next place. It's just that they learn how to manage it better. They learn what their feeling is better. So Ludwig Aberg, amazing. Did you see, Bash, did you see the uh, the injury of Jordan Travis at Florida State? The yes. quarterback? Yeah, it just threw up in my mouth. Yes, awful. I was watching the game, and all of a sudden, as soon as the trainers came out, they were running out with the cart and the air cast. Looks like a dislocated ankle, probably a tibia fib fracture. Uh, nasty. Um, yes. Nasty, nasty. Leg was pointing sideways. Yes. Yes. We've seen mm. that before. We've had that before. We had one at Kenyon Drake at Alabama a couple years ago yeah. um, at Ole Miss. Um, you know, it's a, it's a terrible injury to, to, to go through. It's going to be very interesting from a team dynamic um, and how – Florida State, who is number four in the college football playoff, undefeated, going to be playing um, Florida this weekend, Louisville next weekend to, to try to get into the playoff system, how they're going to be ranked and how they're going to play with a backup quarterback coming down the stretch in two big games uh, to, to put themselves in the college football playoff. And there's a psychological element to this, right? You could win one for the Gipper, and a lot of team will rally around their backup try to win for Jordan, but I've never been big on that uh, as a motivation because I never want a player to try to do more than what they're trained to do. My answer is if I'm the coach at Florida State to the backup is we knew that we were one snap away at any given moment. You have prepared like a starter. You have played in games. You have executed when we've asked you to execute. We've got a game plan that's going to put us in position. Now, the thing that I see from coaches in this position is they restrict the playbook. They try not to allow a player's talents to work. So the beauty is what I want them to understand. And anytime you're in a coaching situation like this is for a player to play at their best, play from an aggressive mindset. Florida State still, it's like losing a wide receiver, losing a running back. You still have to execute. So, you know, the fan base is going to be on edge and they're going to be worried. Look, there's a reason why that backup quarterback was recruited. Give him the ball and let him do his job. He obviously did a good enough job against North Alabama. I know it's not a big test, but they were down when he came in. Um, so something to think about. Florida is not a big test either. So Florida's actually been playing pretty well. They just haven't been winning games. And then, you know, they beat the living snot out of Tennessee, which now is not looking like that big of a deal. But at the time, Tennessee was really playing really well. Um, so it's going to be interesting. If you look at the history of that rivalry, Tennessee has not won a whole lot. Not against Florida, no. And no matter how good or how bad either well, team is. As Steve Spurrier used to say, you can't play citrus, spell Citrus Bowl without UT. Peyton Wait. Manning never beat Florida. Isn't that crazy? Never. And you grew up a Tennessee fan, right? I did, yeah. Hardcore. So big time. So, But this weekend, Tennessee had Peyton Manning and Dolly Parton on the field. That was the, yeah, it was their version of uh, the Taylor Swift <laughs> saga. So we'll have Dolly. And uh, South Carolina had Day Rule on, who's the DJ. Oh, uh, the DJ. The Sandstorm. Yeah, the Sandstorm. That was awesome. So what about Josh Dobbs? Come on. 
Yeah, he's uh, obviously a smart guy, but uh, just coming Brilliant. in, it was, it, it was really – He literally has a degree in aerospace engineering, and his goal yeah. is to, to work for for rocket science. So he'll probably move be a to, rocket scientist. Yeah. yeah, move to Huntsville at some point. But he is uh, – it, it was fascinating to see him coming in and, like, actually getting in the game – after being on the roster for like two days or a didn't day. Didn't even know the names of the players. Didn't know the names of the players. He's on the sideline five minutes before he's going in the game, two minutes before he's going in the game, talking, learning the offensive lineman's names. Yep. Teaching him or teaching them his cadence. All right. So they don't fall start all over the place. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. Say so like ridiculous to do. And nowadays. Well, you know, the beauty of him is – and, and he make it. That's right, Chris. Make it Justin Jefferson. Jefferson. Right. That'll be huge. Yeah. Which another great thing for people to realize. I mean, here's a two, like maybe a two star out of high school. Right. That's why I hate recruiting rankings. Hate him. Hate him. Hate Stupid. him. Um, and this is the kid who just got to work, did his job. He's got a legacy name at LSU. His brother was a quarterback. His other brother was a safety. Um, he comes in and just with a very crowded, you know, LSU prides themselves in producing wide receivers. And defensive backs gets in there and just balls out, right? And is now putting up numbers that have never been seen in the NFL. Um, so you look at that. I mean, think about what it takes for a player to get in there. There's no excuses. Josh Dobbs, no excuses. No, I'm not um, the pastor. Not that is outstanding. <laughs> um, that is so good. Yeah. There's no excuses from Josh Dobbs. He didn't come in and say. I don't understand this. I don't know. The young man that was the quarterback who went out in the replacements, pretty good, was moving the ball pretty well and got the concussion. But Josh Dobbs brings a level of of calm. He brings a level – I mean, his intellect is off the chart, says a quarterback. Probably sees the field as good as anybody. Um, the question is, and somebody brought this up, what the hell has he been bouncing around the league for? Like – what is it that people don't like in him? And it's the same as, you know, you see that with other quarterbacks. It's like, why do people constantly, like, why do coaches, why do general managers, like, fall in love with certain people and have a bias towards others where that bias is, um, it's like they can't get it done, and yet they continue to perform. Like, I don't get it. Like, I, I don't. It, it's interesting, and and I think sometimes as coaches, as players, we have to realize that there are biases. Coaches will make a decision on somebody, and I've heard this from recruiting coordinators of, this is a kid who can't get it done. And I'm like, based on what? You saw him play for two innings. You saw him play a game. And as coaches, we have to – Butch Thompson, the head baseball coach at Alabama, we or at Auburn, we were sharing the stage – at a baseball conference a couple of years ago. And he said something that I thought was so poignant that is so critical. And it was this, every single player that you have on your roster deserves the right to improve, respect their improvement. I love that because I think sometimes we as coaches are looking for the, the big time hit, the immediate walk in the room, you know, they got the it factor, but the reality is every player has the right to improve. And when you look at players and when coaches understand the developmental path of a player, that they can support their development, they can support building a team around them, they can support coaching to their strengths and overcoming some weaknesses, you put a player in the right situation, all of a sudden they get comfortable. There's a great example of that at Alabama. There's a great example of that at LSU with Jaden Daniels, who came in last year, he was okay. He was good. Joe Burrow, his freshman, his first year at LSU was okay. He was good. It wasn't until he got his clock cleaned in a bowl game did all the players start respecting him. Um, so you know, when I look at those things, and I under, and I want you to understand is like as coaches, give your players the right to improve. Don't put them in a box. I, I've I've got numerous times I've had coaches tell me. Player doesn't have it. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And I'm like, give them the chance. You recruited them or they're on your roster. Coach them up. Coach them up. Coaches, 
players change over time. They are not static. They are developmental. And sometimes a player gets in a situation where the game slows down and they find themselves. Happened to me. I can give you handfuls of players that it's like. The fact that you can blow the dust off of a diamond and get it to showcase itself as a coach, that should be something you should be looking for. That is a sign of a great developmental team and somebody who built a program around the player versus people saying, well, I missed on the recruiting or this kid doesn't have it. What is it? What is it? They don't have it. What is it? The fact that they don't remind you of yourself. Is that what it is? See, I think that's what it is more than anything else. That the coach has this misconstrued belief of what they were when they played, that that player needs to reflect that. My God, a player can develop over four years. Okay, High school coaches have the tough thing sometimes of having to make cuts. But sometimes a cut kid can come back around better than the kids that you had on your roster. Give them that opportunity. And Bo Nix just went to an easier conference. Sorry. They don't play defense up there. I think Bo Nix was always good. I I think he was brutally coached at Auburn under Gus Malzahn. Brutally. I think he's obviously a good quarterback. And then he went to a place that had better coaching with flag football defense. So, I mean, come on. They're playing USC. USC gives up like 800 yards a game. Okay. So, coaches, please, please, please give your players chances to freaking improve. And that's not a sign that you miss. That's not anything. That, come on now. Um, you know, if, if we're going to look at a player and make an early judgment, Are we making a judgment based on what indicators? Chris just said he's a golf roster of 23 at Catholic High. That's insane. Uh, unbelievable. Had to cut 10 players a year this year. I had three guys cut last year that made the team this year. Yeah. I mean, listen, a player goes back, practices, busts their tail, gets better, finds it, and comes back. Yeah. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. Remember Rave Rhymes? Kid gets cut from LSU baseball. He goes to LSU Eunice. Did you coach him? Mm, no. He's, no, the year after or the year okay. before. And uh, next thing is hitting 480 at LSU or something stupid. Okay. Sometimes kids find it. Sometimes kids find it. Sometimes it's a situation. But coaches, give them the right to improve. Don't make assumptions early. I know you're pressure, you've got pressure, but sometimes kids grow. Sometimes they learn, sometimes they develop, sometimes they find themselves. So I encourage all that. What kind of questions we got today? First of all, what are you doing with a mic over there? Can is it bouncing around? Yeah, you're killing I keep me. Hitting it on accident. I think it's because absolutely they, killing me. Okay, blowing my ears out. All right, I think it's because of the amount of protein and caffeine I had this morning. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I mean, yeah, if we could, if, that thing is uh, hit, hitting. Yeah. Um, First off, I want to give a shout out to Jason, who is multitasking, teaching a class, and listening to the show, and broadcasting the show to his whole class. So shout out to did he? Did, did Jason bring out the cart with the TV on it and say today is video day and we're going to watch a National Geographic film or something? <laughs> I mean, is that what he's doing? Probably. 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 Yeah. All right. Uh, I got some good questions as always, um, okay. Luke. Says I'm a four handicapper in high school, and this past season I played well, but it seemed like when I practiced my butt off and really grinded, I just got got I just got to a blockade where I wasn't getting any better. Good question. Um, nice playing as a high schooler or a four handicap. Okay. Um, it's always an interesting thing. So golf is one of those sports that the more you practice, sometimes the worse you get because there's a expectation that comes with, I've done this work, I've demonstrated it, I can do it over there. But the problem is, is that competition and um, practice are not the same thing, okay? So Luke, the questions that I would wanna know is, 
the first thing I would want to do is reframe your head a little bit and say, let's uh, let's remember that the practice we're doing is an investment that does not have a maturity date. I don't know when that stuff is going to work. So we're working on tools and we need to be working on competitiveness during that time too. Okay. About 15% of your practice should be uh, some failure associated with it. Now, the bigger point of that is, is that there is a plateau that happens in golf where players will go, 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 and then kind of hit that plateau and maybe struggle a little bit. And you got to be understanding as to why that's happening. And then all of a sudden you'll go again and you'll push again. Golf has a very limited range of improvement opportunities in it. We're talking very small elemental changes. And so the things I would be looking at statistically or looking in your game is, you know, while we may be pitching the ball great in practice, where are we not getting it close to in the hole? So now that five and six footer means a lot more than what we had in practice. So the thing is I would look at is I would identify one massive growth indicator to focus on in the off season and in tournament season. So in other words, it may be, you know, when I look at it and I'm honest with myself, I'm short sighting myself with an approach shot too many times in a round. I want to reduce that, but still stay on offense. Or it may be, I want to improve my make percentage from five feet. Am I really doing the practice? Am I doing the, the closer drill, which is 24 putts around an eight foot, uh, five foot circle from eight different stations? Got to run 24 in a row, three from each station. Anytime you miss, you start over. Things like that, that I would be looking at to say, are we doing it? And then when you go practice, when you go compete, excuse me, is you're not trying to validate the training you've done, but you look at it as like, I've done a lot of work. I'm ready to compete. And over time, I'm going to see this improvement. So let's try to get to a three handicapper instead of a scratch player. And then go from there. Nice. Uh, from Tyler, big fan of MGL and your books. Uh, taking the attacker course. One question I have is how do you recommend warming up for tournaments compared to a normal practice? So I want every player to have a warm up routine that gets them ready. And one of the first things that I believe in is I don't want you to hit balls to warm up. I want you to get warm before you ever hit balls. Okay. So go through a dynamic warm up. You call your trainer, your strength coach. Go on TPI. They've got some mytpi.com. They got some great information on warming up. We got to get moving, right? Too many golfers go out and they start warming up with a 60 degree. Their backs, their hips, all that's not loose. And then they start judging performance. So what I want you to do is get loose and then hit some shots to start. This is my recommendation. I want you, if you told me that you hit 10 drivers and 10 wedges and that you felt good, then I'd be good with that. Okay. But this is what I suggest. Take a uh, nine iron or eight iron and just fire balls into the range with no targets. You were just breaking up scar tissues, what I call it. Then we're going to hit some longer irons, maybe some five irons. Then what I want you to do is I want you to know like what are your one or two foundations. So if you're if you have a mechanical cue or key, so for instance, for me, it's I want to feel like I'm hitting a three quarter takeaway. And I want to feel like my right hand is pair, is square to the ball and impact with the handle in front. Those are the only two things I focus on. So I'm gonna work, I'm gonna focus on hitting some shots with a three-quarter backswing with a seven iron, maybe five to ten. And then I'm gonna think about five to ten with my hands in front at contact with my right hand making that kind of connection. Then after that, then I'm gonna move up through the bag, hitting different shots. So in other words, I've dialed in the mechanics before it goes wrong and it shouldn't take many to get that feel. Then I'm going to hit different shots. And then by the time I end, I'm going to hit a couple with full routine and full target. If I can do those different things, the better I'm going to be. What happens is players get out there and they're nervous and they're stressed and they're trying to evaluate what they have in the moment. They're trying to evaluate what kind of golf shot that they've got, what kind of movement they have what kind of freedom they feel, all that other stuff. And what happens is that they end up falling into a trap of finding it and fixing it on the range. And then when they go out on the golf course, they can't repeat it. And their mind goes into a tank. The goal of getting loose in a tournament warm-up is to get loose, to warm up. I like players to believe that they always have their skills and tools, and it's just a matter of how do they utilize it in the heat of the moment. Okay? Good question. 
let's go to uh, the next question that I saw in here that I thought was good is um, of your PGA Tour players and elite players, what is one common denominator that they don't do well? Reflect and self-analyze. Um, and, and that's okay. Okay, it's really hard to take a long look uh, assessment of what's going on. Um, and golf leads to emotional, um, uh, emotional, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Emotional, golf leads to emotional decision-making. We lose emotional discipline on a uh, regular basis. And as a result, we don't do a really good job of evaluating. Many times in the round of golf, we could play really well and it just doesn't go our way. For so long, golf has been coached and taught that golf is, is you competing against yourself. That is the most dangerous. That is the most detrimental process and decision that you can actually have. You do not compete against yourself. If you compete against yourself, you will never succeed. You compete against a challenge course, an obstacle course. And that obstacle course is 18 holes with 18 different demands for you to try to shoot the lowest score that you can. That you're walking around with quicksand, you're walking around with challenges, risk, thing. That's why you don't compete against yourself. You're not on a drag race. You're not in a scripted stage presentation. You're playing something that has changing demands on you. So what we have to do is learn how to evaluate our performance. That's why I believe in my journal so much, which is, the journal after every round of golf, what are three things that you did well today? What are three things that you didn't do well? And what are three things that you can learn going forward or that you learned about yourself in the heat of the moment? Okay. Those allow you to process information and learn that not everything is crap. The reason why we lose emotional discipline in golf in our analysis and review is that one, we're always trying to fix the problem to feel better. Number two is we assume that we are always the fault for why we didn't play well. Sometimes it's circumstances, sometimes it's conditions, sometimes it's bad breaks. And three, it takes so much emotional investment to play well that we are so invested emotionally and ego-based that when we get done, we want to hurry up and fix it. It's a way to protect ourselves. If you're a coach or a player or a parent, I don't like players. I don't like anybody to evaluate their performance for three hours after the, the match, the round. So our golf coach is on here. Hey, that was a great round of golf. Hey, you gave it everything you had. We'll talk about it later. Um, and it is one of those things that you've got to understand how to balance and you've got to understand how to evaluate. We don't need to micromanage everything that we do. There are five reasons why you play bad or you have a bad shot. Number one is poor preparation. You weren't really prepared the way you wanted to, or you, were, you weren't prepared to play in the conditions or the type of shots you needed to hit. Number two, it was bad strategies. You tried to go at pins you shouldn't go at. You tried, you know, you can use this in any sport, right? Bad strategy, like our offensive game plan was poor. Number three, it's just bad execution. We are not robots. We are not built for rote memory and repetition. So it could be that. Four, it could just be bad mental focus. We just had a hard time focusing on being where our feet were, playing the shot in front of us. Or last, sometimes it's just bad fortune, bad luck. The odds are against us. So when you understand how to evaluate those things, what you do is you realize that you, you, know, you, you can evaluate and self-assess to then look at it and go, you know what? I actually played pretty well. I mean, you know, oh, I drove the ball terrible today. God, it was awful. When you look back, you only had one bad drive. You may not have felt comfortable on tee boxes, but you only had one bad drive. So that's actually pretty good. But we have to understand those things. So self-assess is what I would say. Let's go to one more question here. Robbie asks, lack of confidence at the beginning of a tournament, boogie first four holes, and then completely believe I can play last 14, four under to get back to even. Why will a young player mind change like that? So we called this in baseball the inevitable two to start the game. It's harder in the beginning of the game because the rhythm isn't there, the umpire strike zone's not there, and so forth, right? There's all these different feels. 
So we assume in golf that we're going to go into something that feels good because it should be good. The reality is the first four holes are the toughest. Your expectations are higher. You're probably mentally communicating with yourself in a weird way. Um, and so what I want you to do is look at it differently. Okay. More than likely, once you hit four over the pressure barrier burst, you got comfortable and you got aggressive. So, Robbie, what I would encourage you, if anybody who's struggling coming out of the gate, is have a game plan for the first three holes that are based on highly competitive, highly comfortable, confident-based swings that you can do, okay? And then build from that. How do you get, Jason, how do you get teams to believe they can win when they haven't beat a particular team for years? Okay, number one thing. Number one thing, okay? You got to get players... Okay, you got to remember that players truly lack belief. They lack belief in self. So we've got to do what we can to instill belief in them. And a lot of that is communication based on you can do this. This is how we're going to do it. I'm going to put you in the right positions. Okay, so I just want you to trust me. I just want you to trust the way we go about doing things. Okay, I see yourself in this position. You need to see yourself there. I believe in you. A lot of positive, constructive terminology in that situation. And tell them, hey, listen, we're going to go against a team we haven't played before. Okay? It's, or we haven't beaten in a long time. So you know what's going to happen. We're going to get a little bit on top, and then we're going to start giving it back because they're good. They're going to come back. And we got to be prepared. And so I'm going to make some adjustments when that happens, when their surge comes. But I'm going to put the players in there that I know that can handle it. And, I'm and the players that are on the bench, guess what? Your time is coming. And when I put you in, this is when I need you. Talk to them like you're the pilot of an airplane that's about to fly through turbulence. Braden asks, how do you handle thoughts about score towards the end of a round? Remember, you can't control thought. I talk about that in Kick Anxiety's Ass. Okay, can't control thought. So instead of trying to control those thoughts, know that those thoughts are going to originate, but then, then remind yourself why you're out there. That no score is a given that what is important is the quality and pride of the next shot you hit. So we're going to invest ourselves in the next shot and grind through that period. That's a very, very tough place to be, and I hear that a lot. All right, 15 minutes to the top of the hour. i got to get ready for appointment sake. Make sure you pick up Kick Anxiety's Ass. If you're on Instagram, go to it. Uh, you can do that on Amazon. It's a great gift for anybody out there right now. Um, please get the word out. We need to change our dynamic and our rhetoric in this world towards mental health. We can win the mental health game by taking control of our lives, taking control of the real of the understanding of where we put our attention. Kick anxiety's ass can change uh, can change lives. It will. It does. Please, please, please go Bears, Chris. Tell everybody at Catholic High School that uh, I'd love to come see them at some point. Um, uh, best by far the greatest school of developing young men in the country, um, and and I say that very confidently. Okay, so. Um, Please, hope everybody has a wonderful Thanksgiving. Tom, I hope you have a wonderful Thursday since you won't be celebrating Thanksgiving on that day, but you can. You can go to Tim Hortons and get some turkey and dressing, uh, but uh, have some coffee and donuts for us, Tom, up there as you watch some great uh, ice hockey. To everybody else, thank you so much for supporting Mental Game Live. Please share the message. Please let people know that if they're struggling with their mental game, we have a great resource here that they can come, and it's totally free. How can you beat that? All the replays are all over our social media. If you love, if you love, you love, kick anxiety's ass, please send, put up a, a comment on Amazon.com. Okay, till then, I will see all you guys uh, next week. And we're going to be talking about year-end assessments.